As WWE wrestling fans, one of the nights of the year that we're supposed to look the most forward to isn't always even just WrestleMania. It's that Raw after WrestleMania. In recent years, it's kind of become its own entity. It's become its own thing. So, of course, now, instead of allowing something to organically be that way and just naturally be great like it had been in previous years, last year and especially this year, the WWE, I think, felt some of the pressure to really deliver in this spot and try to live up to that hype and try to make something big happen. Uh, but I have to say, while in theory it was a good Raw, that I won't dispute. It was an easy Raw to sit through. It had enough entertaining moments. This definitely did not measure up to the shows of previous years. It wasn't even as good as the Raw after WrestleMania last year, which I didn't think it measured up to those previous years either, You know, especially 2011 to 2014. Just... A lot missing on this show, and in a lot of ways, it was a combination of further validating to me that WrestleMania 32, which had just happened the night before, was a colossal waste of mine and everybody else's time. It was, again, a reminder that there is absolutely no emphasis placed on storyline continuity whatsoever. It also was a reminder to me that this company really doesn't have things that well planned out that far in advance whatsoever because it literally seems like they will throw shit against up the wall and just hope it sticks. Then you'll see some examples of where the priorities are just exactly not where they need to be and they are ass backwards or in the wrong fucking place. And all the while, even from the very beginning of the night, when you've got the commentators sitting there and talking about the show and the way that they do and the way that they're setting it up, it feels like a kid or a friend or a family member, a significant other that is coming to you and you're asking them about something and you're getting this whole big spiel, this whole big setup, and you're just sitting there wondering, I'm wondering when they're going to get to the point. I know they're hiding something or I know they are full of shit, and they're trying to make it look not as bad as it actually is. And from the very beginning, you could see the JBLs and the Byron Saxons and the Michael Coles trying to set this up about how the crowd will boo who they want and cheer who they want. Da, 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 da. You know, it just felt like one pathetic Roman Reigns defense mechanism. Let's just call it as we see it. You have to go that far and that hard to try and protect it. I don't know why. Because if you're the WWE, let's face it, you care about reaction. It's been the entire modus operandi with Cena for over a decade now. Doesn't matter how many times the fans have tried to hijack the character, tried to hijack segments that he's involved with, tried to boo him out of the building. The WWE cares about reactions. They do not care about babyface reactions. They do not care about heel reactions. They care about reactions. Because in their opinion, reactions equal level of care. Reactions equal money. That's their opinion. Fair or not, right or not, wrong or not. That's the truth, and that's the reality. So I think sometimes fans, we can all get far too concerned about who gets what type of reaction. Because sometimes, frankly, the WWE doesn't care. Furthermore... It astounds me that the WWE would be so concerned about it because, frankly, they shouldn't care either. Because as long as the dude's getting a reaction, that's all they've seemed to care about for years, why would you be trying to go to such great lengths to take reins now? It didn't stop you from cramming Cena down our throats for a decade. But anyways, I digress. You know, when I look at this show, there are things that I liked. You know, and some of the guys, I got their spotlight, their moment here. Obviously, I was down with Apollo Cruz's debut. I'm excited to see what the future holds for him. I was excited to see freaking Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy, and I can't wait to see what they do or how they screw these guys up. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this Raw after WrestleMania, it should be a combination of a lot of different things. And there was just a lot missing. I mean, when you look at it, there was absolutely no Triple H, no Stephanie, no Brock Lesnar, no Dean Ambrose, no Undertaker. I mean, these are all significant people. 
that were given significant television time in the build-up to WrestleMania 32 and given significant exposure and time for WrestleMania 32, the event itself. And not a single one of them was there. That's just astounding to me. Now, somebody will try to sit there and give you the pathetic spin about, well, Ambrose wasn't there because he was trying to sell his injuries. What fucking injuries did he get in that lame-ass street fight? Shane McMahon wrestled almost three times as long in a much more brutal match and took far bigger bumps, and yet there he was kicking off the damn show. It's just astounding to me. You know, part of WrestleMania is the payoff, is the follow-up, and where do you go from there? And all of these people weren't there. They weren't involved with the Raw after WrestleMania. And that stuck out to me in a big way, and I really noticed it. But it's also storyline continuity or a lack of it. So right from the very beginning, it's Vince McMahon, and then it's Shane McMahon. And now after all this shit for weeks and weeks, actually a month plus now, with freaking Shane McMahon, and not wanting him to win at WrestleMania because you don't want him to have control of Raw, Literally, the next night after he just lost the opportunity to run Raw, Vince McMahon gives him the opportunity to run Raw. That makes absolutely no fucking sense. And even the way they did it here, it's just like you're sprinkling in a couple of Shane McMahon appearances and that's it. There was nothing big, nothing of significance that really happened here. It just basically, to me, validated that that WrestleMania 32 match between him and Taker was a colossal waste of time, especially if Shane is going to fucking be there anyways. Why would anybody care to spend money to watch these matches if the results don't matter, if there is no significance or consequences to the outcomes? And clearly, based off of what happened there, there was none, and there was no question answer because as soon as he was given this power for the night, Vince leaves and nothing else is addressed. It's just astounding to me. Then you look at something like the New Day defending the tag titles against the League of Nations. It's cool that at the end, the Wyatt family came out and attacked the League of Nations. You know, the Wyatt family needs a character change. They need to stop pushing them as heel because it's not working. It's stagnated their characters significantly. This is long overdue. But here we go. We just had the League of Nations win at WrestleMania 32 the night before in a match that wasn't for the tag titles. So that way, come the night after WrestleMania on the big deal Raw, where the titles are on the line, they go on and lose, and then they get their asses kicked by the Wyatt family. Once again, the focus isn't on the New Day. It's just astounding to me. Again, why would anybody care about the WrestleMania match if the next night you're going to come right back and basically do the same thing? But this time it's an even more important stipulation because this one actually involves the tag titles and then the champions retain any fucking ways just so that way the emphasis is on another team possibly turning face, beating up the villains that just lost. The villains that can't get any heat, mind you. Even when they try. I mean, it is just absolutely astounding to me astounding to me the lack of storyline continuity throughout the course of the night and just the the senselessness of some of the things that they did here you know it's cool when they had Roman Reigns come out and he didn't talk much that's fine you know and, and they're they're giving him edge and they're trying to give him badassness and they're trying to give him hard assness you know Jericho comes out great he just won his match at WrestleMania maybe he's a viable a short-term contender for Roman Reigns. But here comes Kevin Owens, who didn't fucking win his match at WrestleMania. Here comes Sami Zayn, who didn't win his match at WrestleMania. Here comes AJ Styles, who also didn't win his match at WrestleMania. So three of these four guys have never held the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, didn't even win the WrestleMania match from the night before, have never won a WrestleMania match, and yet all of a sudden they think that they are worthy opponents for Roman Reigns. They think are, they are worthy contenders for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. And then we make a four-way match out of these guys. That's just astounding to me. And then especially knowing what happened at the end of the night, and I'll get to that in a moment, and the ridiculousness of all of that. But, you know, as I sat here and I watched it, instead of in previous years where you would have The Rock lay down the gauntlet with John Cena talking about setting up to WrestleMania 28 the night after WrestleMania 27, you've got Brock Lesnar coming back, The Raw after WrestleMania 28, having big things like this happen. 
it felt like this was just an NXT showcase. And maybe that's why some people really, really love this show, because they got to see so many NXT guys. But you know, you need more than that. And especially with all the big names that weren't there. I mean, it's like, Roman Reigns just beat Triple H, and Triple H can't be bothered? We're trying to figure out who will take on Roman Reigns next. Uh, ding dong, dumb dicks. You know, I realized we forgot about the whole rematch clause after the Royal Rumble with Roman Reigns, but you would think the heel authority figure like Triple H, who is still technically in charge, has power on the show, would have a guaranteed rematch in the contract, so that way he would get to face Roman Reigns again at a time of his choosing. You would think right there, built-in, number one contender, built-in rematch, there's a purpose for them to have another match, especially if the next show is going to be called Payback. But instead, we're doing this freaking four-way crap. And again, it's just, what are we doing? You know, you had that nice moment of Zack Ryder winning the IC title to kick off WrestleMania 32. Great moment. And I like the fact that they did that, in part because, like I said, it would give you a chance to spin off Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn in a feud that didn't need a title and shouldn't have a title, which is where they're going. And then you had Miz and Zack Ryder feuding over the title, so you get two feuds that can matter instead of one that kind of sort of does. Well, in this case, though, they come right back the night after having Zack Ryder win the belt at WrestleMania. They have him drop the strap to Miz. And it's funny because I'm sitting there and looking at it. When he's getting into that shouting match, the confrontation with Ryder's dad at ringside, I mean, Ryder's dad's a badass fuck. That's a big, swole dude. I sit there and look at him, and I think that Ryder's dad could not only take Miz, but take the majority of the roster. Probably not the intended consequence of that showdown and confrontation here. I mean, but to me, the whole ridiculousness of this, and we all know this is the case, this was not about Miz getting the IC title, even though it works, and he is always, to me, when utilized properly, a really good mid-card heel champion, one of the true few heels you have, one of the best at doing his actual job in all of the WWE. This was about spotlighting the returning Maurice. Maybe she ran out of cocaine and chocolate cake, so she needs money. She thought another one of those divas that thought she would be better if she left, and of course she wasn't, so now she's broke and she needs money and drugs and chocolate cake and all of that crap. So now, instead of it being about The Miz and winning the title, we know what it's about. This was all just a plot device, a ploy to bring back Marie so that way we can get her involved in Total Divas. So again, we're taking what should be a significant title, and we're making the few not even so much about the title. It will be of some consequence here, but the reason and the impetus for all this being done it's not because of The Miz, it's because of Maurice and what they probably want to do with Maurice, which is put her on the next season of Total Divas. So again, we're taking the show that gets three times the viewership and sacrificing it for a show that gets a third of the viewership on a different network at a different night. Does that make any fucking sense to anybody whatsoever? No, it does not. Period. Then you look at Baron Corbin. You've got him winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. So after that big, potentially career-launching victory at WrestleMania the night before, that signature moment, how do we decide to repay that? We have him sit there and wrestle Dolph Ziggler to a fucking double countout. That's just dumb. Then you've got him yelling at the ref at the end that this is your fault. It's just stupid. How can you fuck up rolling these guys out? You know, if Corbin's that bad, just have him destroy Dolph Ziggler and don't even wrestle the match. Or have him sit there and get disqualified. Or have Baron Corbin get counted out because he's laid waste to Dolph Ziggler and he fucking walks off like this jobber bitch isn't even worth his time because he fucking not. You know, you take guys like this who could have some potential and then you just feature him in this way. Like the way they initially kicked off Apollo Crews I thought was very, very good here. But the way they did it with Baron Corbin, not so much. This is a bigger dude. You don't need to be making him look vulnerable, making him look stupid. But of course that's what they did. Then, of course, you've got the Usos and the Dudleys wrestling again. Now, since they just wrestled on the WrestleMania 32 pre-show the night before again, for the vindicating, why in the fuck would you watch the main show or the pre-show of the main show when you'll just get the same shit or better shit again the following night? This time we actually get a tables match between the Usos and the Dudleys. And now the Dudleys are fucking winning the match. So we give the Usos the victory on the pre-show at Mania, but it's not a table match. They just put them through tables, which in theory should be the end of it, just so that way we can come back the next night 
And now we've got the Dudley Boys winning the tables match, so that way we could potentially launch off into something between them and Enzo and Cassidy. I guess. I guess. And then, for some reason, you know, while it's okay that they had Summer Rae actually say a little something to try and put some purpose between a match with her and Sasha Banks, why is Sasha Banks wasting her fucking time with Summer Rae? Why would she be wrestling Summer Rae? And then further on, later on in the night, you know, you're doing this whole big reveal segment, this big presentation, trying to make it feel like when Macho Man became the Macho King and he was presented his crown and his scepter and all that awesomeness from back in the day. This wasn't. You know, you've got Charlotte sitting there. You can tell it felt like she lost her composure a little bit when the crowd was trying to do their own thing. I don't think she really knew how to react. But the whole premise of this segment, you know, you had her retain, which I still think was a bad decision. Then you come back here, and this is how you do things. Instead of, you know, hey, saying Sasha Banks didn't get beat at WrestleMania. It was Becky Lynch that did. And launching logically right back into more issue between... Sasha Banks and Charlotte, for some reason, Natalia comes back into the fucking mix. And we're funky emphasizing Natalia again. Why in the fuck are we emphasizing Natalia again? When it's not time to do it, it's not right to do it. It doesn't make sense to do it. Sasha Banks is right there. Sasha Banks makes all the sense in the fucking world. But instead, all these other girls are... Leaving out in Natalia's The Voice of Reason. Now, maybe if there was no clear-cut, logical opponent or next step, this makes a world of sense. You could believe Natalia being a diva's lo women's locker room leader. But in this case, you've got Sasha Banks. She didn't technically get pinned or submitted at WrestleMania. That was Becky Lynch. You move on from Becky Lynch. And now you just dive into Charlotte and Sasha Banks. And now they're fucking muddy in the waters here and doing this other bullshit. It's just dumb. Dumb. And I guess in general, it was just a, a night of disappointment to me because, like I said, it just further validated that the almost seven hours that I spent between the pre-show and the main card of WrestleMania 32 was, as I feared it would be, just a colossal giant waste of my fucking time. And I'm tired of this company wasting my fucking time. And I know some of you that love NXT will think this fucking Raw After Mania was awesome. It was an acceptable, passable, viewable for three hours raw. But again, the storyline continuity non-existent. The invalidation of what happened the night before by doing a lot of shit that the exact night after and doing a lot of dumb shit with it is just fucking ridiculous and astounding to me. But the worst thing of all, is the biggest return you really got on the entire night of Cesaro. And you're going to believe me, I'm happy to see Cesaro. But at this point in time, you've taken Zayn out of the four-way number one contenders match to see who will face Reigns for the title. Even though, again, Triple H should have the title shot because it's been something we've been basing their creative process off of for 30 years now. Champion loses, gets guaranteed title rematch, unless there's specific stipulation saying that they don't. Just saying. So now, you get to this four-way match. And, you know, it's one of these things that I don't think this company knows what the fuck they're doing. They just don't. Because now you bring back Cesaro. At this point in time, at this moment, either he should be winning... Or Kevin Owens should be winning, because if anything, Sami Zayn could cost Kevin Owens the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, and then, man, you're really off to the races with those two in a feud. That, that could carry you to the summer. Or you have Chris Jericho win it, because he did just beat AJ Styles at WrestleMania. He's a former multiple-time world champion. You've already established Chris Jericho somewhat as a heel, so maybe you trust in his talents enough to try and get over enough as a heel, to get over Rick Roman Reigns just enough as a likable guy where Reigns doesn't get booed out of the building every fucking week. But instead of going with the nice shock surprise, you know, let's go with a guy like Cesaro who could have a really good physical type of brawl with Roman Reigns where it's not a lot about talk, it's a lot about action and physicality, and maybe uh, Reigns 
not being that likable to a lot of people won't matter as much. Or Kevin Owens, who could do some Kevin Owens things that will at least make it passable. But again, there could be some good chemistry there. There could be a good um, flow in terms of styles there. Or Chris Jericho, because of who Chris Jericho is, coming off of that big victory at WrestleMania 32. We'll give this spotlight to AJ Styles. We give this victory to AJ Styles. So we are now basically ensuring that Roman Reigns is going to get the brakes booed off boot off of his punk ass for the next several weeks. If that's not your intention, and that's not your goal, and maybe based off of some of the things you saw this week, maybe that is their goal, and maybe they are slowly going with the heel turn, even though, again, I think that's a ridiculous assertion, because with who Roman Reigns is now, he already is heel, so to turn heel would actually make him the babyface, which creates the whole fucking problem of professional wrestling today, in particular the WWE. The villains are the heroes, the, the heroes are the villains. But why would we do AJ Styles here? He couldn't even beat fucking Chris Jericho at WrestleMania. And now he wins this match to get a title shot against Roman Reigns? Now I'd be okay if you sat there and told me that you were going to have AJ Styles win Money in the Bank. You know, I'd be okay with that. I'd be down with that. But here at this moment, especially if you're not in implicitly trying to change Roman Reigns and you're not trying to do something big in terms of a seismic shift in how you present Roman Reigns, and you're still going to try and fight against the grain, which seems to be how you were setting it up from the very beginning in terms of talking about, well, do people boo or do people cheer? They boo the guys that should be cheered and they cheer the guys that should be booed. Trying to set this all up intentionally, still trying to make it one big Roman Reigns protection mechanism. Why the fuck would you immediately throw him into a match with one of the crowd favorites in AJ Styles for the title? Now they're teasing the fact that AJ Styles could be the champion. How in the fuck do you think that this is going to go well? At least if it was Jericho. Yeah, Jericho would get some of the legend treatment. But at the end of the day, people know Jericho tends to put people over. So there would be some resignation to that fact. You know, at least when it would come to a Cesaro, while people really, really like him, and I like him as an in-ring performer, you know, in terms of the microphone chops and the overall charisma and personality, it's not exactly like he has a ton more than Roman Reigns. So in some ways, it eliminates that anti-Roman Reigns argument if you put Cesaro there. And then in terms of Kevin Owens, you know, maybe that creates some issue there. It gets people, you know, to think that Kevin Owens could have that title. But there will still be some in the crowd that will actually boo Kevin Owens. Some people that don't like Kevin Owens. Pretty much almost everybody likes AJ Styles. And if you're trying to get people to actually like Roman Reigns, which it still seems like the WWE is trying to do, why in the bluest of blue fucks would you put AJ Styles in this spot where he's in theory one match, one move, one pinfall, or one submission away from being the WWE World Heavyweight Champion? when he just lost at WrestleMania the night before to the same guy in Chris Jericho who three years ago lost to fucking Fandango at WrestleMania 29. And mind you, Fandango's first ever match. The lack of storyline continuity, the lack of following up effectively on the biggest show of the year is just mind-blowing to me. It is just ridiculous. And sure, people get caught up because they see these NXT guys come up and it's like, ooh, happy day, uh, happy day nothing. That doesn't make it any fucking good. And it's Raw after WrestleMania. It's okay to have some of these guys debut, but it shouldn't be a fucking NXT showcase. Let's just call it how we see it. You know, and this is again where I'm kind of, you know, to some I'll be preaching to the choir and some the message will go right over your heads because you love NXT, you love the style of NXT, so how dare anybody any, ever say anything shitty about NXT whatsoever? Because you talk about the in-ring action. Whatever. But even in this case, it's just, again, some of the biggest names weren't there. No Triple H, no Brock Lesnar, no Dean Ambrose, no Undertaker, no Stephanie McMahon. None of these people that were integral parts of WrestleMania's buildup, integral parts of WrestleMania, the event itself, and matches themselves, none of them were there. I mean, just astounding how stupid this company is. And, and the sad thing is, is this is usually supposed to be the best Raw of the year, and it usually ends up being. If this is the best Raw we're getting this year, 
it just speaks to how bad 2016 is going to be. If you thought 2015 or some other previous years were bad, ugh, buckle up your trim straps. It's going to be a bumpy ride.